We have a studio audience here, and we're going to give them an opportunity to ask questions, and I'm sure they're going right. to be very interesting. Sir. Well, Dr. Lee, uh, I think I'm qualified to ask you this question for uh, one reason, that I'm a past president of a hospital here in Passaic. In your opinion, uh, has there been uh, an actual increase in the number of people who have uh, uh, been in remission uh, on their cancer uh, by virtue of their strength and their chemistry, or by virtue of the treatments which have been advanced in oncology? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question, sir. And um, recently, um, attempts have been made to try to answer that. It's a little more complicated than people might uh, uh, think. Um, everybody acknowledges that overall, the treatment success for cancer by um, conventional medicine uh, has not changed in its uh, success rate. Now, there are exceptions. Hodgkin's disease, childhood leukemia, they have remissions that appear to be permanent, lifelong Not remissions. Not permanent, I think, but okay. if we use that long five years time, survival. But for childhood leukemia and Hodgkin's, there seem to be some advance has been made. For breast cancer, lung cancer, stomach cancer, cancer of the pancreas, bone cancer, and so on, there's been no difference in the results of treatment. What has differed is that they have been able to diagnose the cancer earlier. And since they go by five-year survival estimates or five-year survival results, they've increased the five-year survival results because they have started counting a year or two sooner. And that's what's really happened. There has been a, uh, a big increase of lung cancer in the women, for instance. Yeah, well, a couple of friends of mine uh, that, uh, that I know have uh, had cancer and have gone on remission and are leading normal lives, so to speak. Right. Uh, but uh, there's no specific uh, number of uh, increases in, in remission. I mean, can you tell by overall or sectional or whatever means? Right. I think that a lot of the cases of remission that I know about are people who were involved in alternative therapies, people who made changes in their life that then have added years to their life. The ones I see that were treated by ordinary or even very sophisticated oncology, I'm not convinced myself by the experience of my patients that there's been any great advance. And there's no difference in age or chemistry, strengths, or things of that nature. Well, there, everybody's an individual, and there are individual differences. Yeah. And I'm sure that the day will come when we're going to see that there are individual factors behind the cancer. But just because you name the cancer by the organ that it appears to be attacking doesn't mean it's really the same cancer that someone else has. I I get what you mean. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Very good question. Ruth, what yes. do you think about uh, that? You see more cancer patients than I did in practice. Well, I think the statistics are fudged a little bit uh, in that uh, a patient, uh, they use that artificial five-year survival yardstick, you know, and now they're able to achieve that position for the breast cancer patients because they find tiny cancers and start to that treat them. Have been found the diagnostic before. work is yeah. better, so they find smaller cancers, and so they have a longer period of time, and they reach the five-year survival, and better even than that. It goes to six, seven, and eight years. Mm -hmm. But you see, and here's another thing, uh, when that patient dies, statistically, as long as they've reached five years, they're alive in numbers. <laughs> it's a strange phenomenon. Right. I think that artificial marker yeah. ought to be dropped. Yeah. I think that uh, one of the statisticians came up with a good, he called it lead time bias. By, by starting a lead time sooner, uh, you yep. bias your results because uh, you make, they make That's it to the five years exactly survival. What yeah. When a group up in Harvard, it wasn't a group, someone up in Harvard was... Uh, I think uh, B-A-I-L-L-O-R. Yeah, that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a statistician. Yeah. He uh, instead of he disregarded the five-year survival mark, but measured how many patients were surviving based on a hundred thousand, right. right. and he found that they we were losing ground. Right. We have another question. Yes, um, I'm 53 years old and I'm in menopause, and I'm in a, a very bad situation here. My mother had osteoporosis and she had a heart attack at my age, and on my father's side, there was cancer. So I just recently had a battery of tests and they told me, make up your own mind. And 
I'm That's where I was 18 years ago. Uh, I'm very <laughs> stressed. Asian. I'm stressed out about this. Oh, but now we have the answer. Okay. Well, I'm taking wild yam. Mm -hmm. Is that good? The Mexican and wild yam. Is that good? Mexican? Okay. And I'm putting that on my body, too. The wild yam. Is that very good for the progesterone? Let me answer this. <laughs> okay. Let, let me answer this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called uh, Mexican wild yam, but it's not related to the yams in the market. That's, okay. It's an underground tuber. It grows like a great big squash of some sort. Mm -hmm. But it's very rich in certain type of fats and oils. Mm -hmm. And these are the fats and oils that were found in 1936 by scientists that could be transformed chemically right. into real, honest-to-God progesterone. We don't do it. We make our cholesterol, we make our hormones from, from cholesterol. But scientists could convert that fat in the plants into real progesterone, which is very well absorbed through the skin, so close to 100% absorbed through the skin. Okay. So is that in saliva. For you to rub on some of the wild yam, mm -hmm. it's a very minute amount. You will absorb probably some fats and oils from there, but your body will not turn that into progesterone. Okay. Some of it may have very tiny effects on your own hormone. It may supply a little estrogen effect. It may supply mm -hmm. a little progesterone effect, but it's not the real hormones that your body makes. So what so do we need? So we should be on a cream that does supply the real progesterone that has been made from the wild yam, and it can be made from 5,000 other plants. It can be made from mm -hmm. the soy. Those particular fats and oils are common throughout lots of plants. And, uh, and in fact, by eating soy or by eating uh, certain grains and eating beans and legumes, the body gets more okay. of the natural hormone or the uh, phytohormone there than that you do from rubbing on that little bit. So. One of the first ones that I ever knew about was Progest. There's a cream called Progest. Yes. And it was the only one that was available. Now we have four or five or six or eight that mm -hmm. have the right amount of progesterone uh, in them. But uh, you're not putting anything at risk by using the real progesterone. And that is in the health food store. They have the progesterone yes, cream. Yes, and there, and there are some companies that sell them as prescription items that your doctor might uh, Well, might she didn't doctor. suggest that, didn't so suggest I'm going to read your book. Read my book. And the, the creams are listed there on page 271. Very good. And uh, there are some there that show how some are very low and some are in the right range. And some are even too high. You know, they're, some they're, too, they're too high, high. and, and you know, there's and no reason to go so high. There's a difference in how they ought to be used for different women. Oh, absolutely, and we do try to go through. They never did a saliva test on me, so I don't know anything about that, so I'm going to read your book, and okay. I'm going to contact Ruth. Okay, Thank that's you. the best.